cognitive modification. So remember, this is the change procedure you're going to be using when you think that the outcome, the behavioral outcome, is influenced by problematic thoughts, unrealistic thoughts, you know, catastrophic thoughts, overestimating things, underestimating things, black and white thoughts, all the kinds of thoughts you find if you look under cognitive therapy manuals by Beck or by Ellis. Um, you, you find these different thoughts, and they're part of DBT also. So that the idea is that cognitive appraisals, how you interpret events, determines your emotional and behavioral responses to events. So cognitive therapies aim to change those typical interpretations, those appraisals, those rules. And the style of cognition, let's say somebody has a very black and white thinking, you want to change that style. So when she says, always this happens, and I say, always? That's why that's a cognitive modifier. It's, it's an attempt to challenge her black and white thinking. <coughs> BPD clients often find cognitive therapies, if you do it by themselves, very invalidating. Because it's kind of like saying, oh, your problem's in your thinking as if it isn't in the horrible life you've led, as if it isn't that you were abused, uh, neglected, or mistreated, or bullied, or teased. It's, oh, it's your thinking. When you go down that road with people with borderline personality disorder and traumatic disorders, you find people dismiss you rather quickly, and they feel just further invalidated. So it's a tricky thing. So Because cognitive therapy is a very good evidence-based treatment for a lot of disorders with anxiety and depression. But borderline is a very complex, chronic, severe disorder. And so if you're working with that, you know, the patient basically feels you're saying your problems are in your head. So you can't just use it by itself. But on the other hand, it's critical. Somebody says, oh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm totally incompetent. And you say, well, actually, you're not totally incompetent because I, I know you. You're competent in lots of ways. No, I'm totally incompetent. You just, you don't really see me. You see me one hour a week. You have no idea how incompetent I am. Well, tell me about it. You know, you hear about some things, you say, okay, so you don't do that very well right now. No, I'm totally incompetent. Now you realize, you know, they're uh, overstating it. They're overgeneralizing. They're overestimating, and they're saying it in a black and white way. And you start to challenge it. You start to raise questions about it. So there's right where the problem comes. You try to tell them they're competent. They say, no, I'm not. You don't know me. You know, I'm evil. You don't think of it that way. You challenge that thought. I'm, uh, I'm a terrible person. All these things. I had a client who would come in, and she said, she would say, I'm the, I am ha half of my left half is the devil. Um, and she would experience that. And there's a long story about how we treated that. But, there's all these thoughts uh, in, that come up right in the moment. And what's important about these is not that you go do deep cognitive therapy in the moment in, in DBT, but that you notice when there's an extreme thought and you pay attention to it and you comment on it. You don't let extreme thoughts go by. That doesn't mean you can stop them. It doesn't mean you can treat them right there. But you say, wow, that's kind of an extreme way of thinking. Or, oh, always, really? I thought blah, blah, blah. Totally incompetent, but actually, you're my only patient who comes on time every week. Whatever that's made up of. Well, that's because I'm totally incompetent. Well, that's a hard sell. You know, so it's sort of like, you know, I, I'm, nobody ever likes me. Well, is that really true all your life? Yeah, it's really true. Okay, you know, I've heard that thought now from you several times. That kind of paves the road to getting nowhere in life, isn't it? Right? Well, but it's true. How can you escape the obvious? Nobody likes me. No one wants lunch with me. Nobody takes me out at night. OK, so these are things we've got to solve. You can't solve them. I'm, I'm unlikable. So all these things you keep running into, like the little brick walls here and there, and you keep commenting on them. And you don't do too much work on them when, everybody's, when people are in the first stage of DBT, where there's a lot of problem behaviors, because there's just too much to do. You just want to keep indicating and undermining. It's like eroding, eroding uh, problematic cognitions by noting them, making a comment, and also accepting them. We'll get to that. 
So cognitive modification in DBT, the way it's different than cognitive therapy is that it's just in the moment most of the time. It's more informal. It's in the moment. Um, and usually you start by looking for the validity in the person's cognition. So you don't just say, no, that can't be. You say, well, what, do, what makes you think you're so incompetent? They tell you these things. And as soon as they start to tell you, it breaks down a little bit more because they're not totally incompetent. So you look for the validity in what they're saying, but then you challenge what they're saying. And it includes two main kinds of things. One thing is called contingency clarification. In a way, I would just restate this if you're not familiar with cognitive therapy. This is all the ways we try to help our patients understand the rules of life and how sometimes their own rules are out of sync with reality of life, with the way other people think. So the if-then relationships in life and in therapy. Yeah, well, if you keep doing that, I know you believe in saying exactly what's on your mind, but you keep losing jobs. So, I mean, I wonder if that's such a, such a good idea. If you keep doing that, you're probably going to keep losing jobs. Or if you tell friends all the dirt that you feel about them, they probably aren't going to like you very much. That's right. But actually, you're quite likable when you're not doing that. But it so sounds like you think you've got to get everything off your chest. You, justice has to be done about what people say. So if you do that, then this will happen. In therapy, if you never once do anything I suggest, I'm a human being. Probably I'll stop suggesting things. That's not what I want to do. But I need to get a little, we need to a little, have a little circuit here between you and me where sometimes something I say is something you try. And actually, maybe it'll help, and you let me know if it helps. You know, because I, you know, we're a team. So um, clarify future contingencies. So you need to clarify what to expect if you have suicidal behavior. What are the rules of the game in this particular treatment, in behaviors that interfere with therapy, if they're bad ones, and uh, therapy in general. Sort of like if you keep doing this, um, we're going to have to change the rules of the game. Yes, I've said you can call me. You can make phone calls. But actually, the way it appears is that you're starting to make more and more phone calls. You're calling me several times a day. And you're sending me voluminous emails. And you're expecting me to respond to all of this. And it ignores the fact that I have other things to do, too. And I can't, I can't do it. Not to mention, it's just, you know, we aren't really, you aren't really talking that much in sessions. So actually, if you. We can't just have the rules keep going that way. So it's being frank about the rules, how therapy's going. And the other part of cognitive modification is called cognitive restructuring. And that's more what you usually think of as cognitive therapy. You observe and describe thoughts, assumptions, and beliefs. Oh, so you have the thought that you're an unlikable person. I'm just starting to get that. You seem to have that in a lot of situations. Well, I am an unlikable person. Oh, so that's a pretty you have a pretty deep thought that you're an unlikable person. It's not a thought, Dr. Swenson. I am an unlikable person. But OK, so it's like so deep that I can't even question it. Well, no, it's real. But OK, and we're going to probably agree to disagree about this for the moment. Because you know, there's only one problem with this. I actually like you. Well, you don't know me yet. Yeah. All right, so you're an unlikable person if somebody gets to know some things about you. Now, anybody, you know, you get into this thing, but you don't give up your side. You validate the other side, but you stick with it. So you observe and describe thoughts, assumptions, beliefs. You identify and challenge dysfunctional cognitions, though you do it in a savvy way, a tactful way, a respectful way, and a validating way. Generate more functional thoughts. Well, what if you think of it this way? What if you think, I'm not very competent under certain circumstances? Yeah, right, I'm not very competent with other human beings. No, I mean something a little more narrow than that. You know, I'm not very competent when such and such is expected of me. Yeah, well, I'm not. Yeah, well, that might be true. There may be some areas that you aren't very competent. What, do you think the rest of the world's all very competent? Don't you think everybody's incompetent? Well, they're not as incompetent as me. Well, that's because you don't know them very well. You know, it's sort of you start to challenge it in a different way by saying, you have this idea that you're incompetent, but actually everybody is. I actually heard Linehan say this on a, on a session on videotape once. 
where this patient was saying, no, no, Marcia, I'm, I'm incompetent about such and such. And she said, yeah, well, you know, we're all incompetent. She says, no, I mean, I'm really incompetent. She said, no, I mean, we're really all incompetent. We're, <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean everybody's incompetent? She said, what you don't know, honey, is that actually everybody's just stringing together their best presentation all the time. Like that might be 1% of who they are, but the other 99%, they're flying without instruments. You know, they really don't know what they're doing, but some people have that skill of seeming like they know what they're doing and being competent, and that actually goes a long ways in life. You don't seem to have that skill. I mean, but I'm not sure you're any more incompetent than anyone else. So it was sort of like a very interesting kind of dialectical way to challenge the deep belief that I'm incompetent by giving up on saying, yes, you are competent, and saying everybody's incompetent. And uh, sort of like, it was, a, it was an interesting thing to see. And finally, you've, you, in, in DBT, which is not like normal cognitive therapy, you really value wise mind thinking. If you're trying to get people to think of what is a functional way to think, it's not just rational thoughts, which was the original conception, uh, or functional thoughts, but also wise mind thinking. And those of you who know DBT well, know there's a whole world of things about wise mind. So somebody could have different thoughts than anyone else in the world, and they might be their wise mind thoughts. And you might want to validate their wise mind thoughts because they're in sync with their own values, their own goals. Mm -hmm.